studying and talking about peripheral subcutaneous stimulation. Uh, this is pretty much a uh, recent option for pain control. We had developed this in the past 15 years. Uh, initially, it was done directly on the top of the nerve. So it was done basically by neurosurgeons. So when we had a suspicion that the pain was generated by any peripheral nerve stimulator, they were going to open the, the area of the ulnar nerve or the any other peripheral nerve, and they're going to dissect into the nerve itself. And they're going to put a lead on the top of the nerve. After they've done this a few times, they realize that after a while, stimulating the nerve directly, number one, the surgical procedure we call the scar formation, and the direct stimulation of the nerve is going to cause more pain than actually relieve. And then even to remove the stimulator, it was a difficulty. So then they move into doing this very close to the nerve, but not really on the top of the nerve itself. But it still is so close to the nerve that they cause a lot of in uncomfortable stimulation after a while. And they decided to do an effude stimulation. There's a big controversy um, uh, among the pain management and neurosurgeons about the definition what the peripheral subcutaneous stimulation is. The, some of them advocate the idea that you're not doing peripheral stimulation. What you're doing is uh, field stimulation because you're not really closing to the nerves. So nonetheless, what we're trying to really um, accomplish is stimulate the terminals of the nerves around the area where the patient has pain. And it can be close to a peripheral nerve or it could be far from the peripheral nerve. Okay. This is the one. So um, how is the technique? The technique is the lead stimulates not a main trunk, and that's why I was just talking, but the small nerve endings within the subcutaneous tissue. The lead has to be near to the area of the pain. And they say you, one lead you're going to cover around your fist. So if you, have, you close your hand and make a fist, that will be the area that one lead is going to be innovating. So if you want to do an area that is much larger than that, you have to put more than one lead. Uh, it's minimally invasive. We're just going subcutaneously. Uh, it's really generated better with the cylindrical leads uh, because of the circumferential electrical field. They thought about it, well, maybe if we put in a, a pedal lead, it's going to have more stability. Uh, but we found that it really doesn't generate as much as electrical field as the cylindrical leads. Um, the lead placement has to be within or as near as possible to the painful area. And as I explained before, is the electrical field is 2.5 to 2 centimeters in diameter. Leads must be placed exactly in the painful area, and trial leads turn up in 48, 72 hours after the trauma has improved. Because if you turn it on right away, the patient is still going to have the trauma and they're going to experience the good improvement. The depth of the needle and lead is usually you're going to go, you have the epidermis, the dermis, and right in between the dermis and the, and the superficial subcutaneous layer, that's when you put your electrode. And then you have the deep subcutaneous, the fascia, and the muscle. It only works different here uh, when you're doing the occipital because you're really on the top of the fascia, okay? Because the area is so small, so really go at the, the fascia and that's where we implanted. Uh, those are some of the pictures of patients when we're doing the stimulation. See, you see here the implant, pretty much this is where we're gonna, the generator is gonna be implanted. And here, this all the tunneling that you need to do. This is actually what makes peripheral nerve stimulator a little cumbersome. is so many leads for you to be driving from one place to the other. So the subcutaneous pla placement is really the, the hard work. Oh, well, it depends on the positioning. Uh, that came really kind of dark. Um, here you can see much better the lights there. If you guys look at here, probably you can see better. The, the, the lights there doesn't show well. But you see here, that's exactly what we do. That is the entry point. You see the ear here, that's pretty much above where the occipital nerve is placing it and making incision here. Do this way and do this way. Those are the leads coming out. 
Okay, I, here also you guys cannot see well because of the lights, but here you can see very well. So look at here. Look at here, Hector. You can see better. Uh, you can see here the leads placement. See? Mm -hmm. Leads here for the occipital area, for the parietal area going there. The occipital area is showing there. Those are how you see. Exactly what we see all the time. Again, here the how it looks. This is a patient that we did um, ox pain for trigeminal neuralgia, and you see here we put one lead here, one lead here, and one lead here. This is we usually pull the skin like this, and really feel the death. It's going to be below this layer, so it's right below this layer. So usually you can feel it, the thickness of the layer. You find usually you can feel like a, a really a, um, a plane and you can see slide into the plane. So you have to be careful about maintaining the plane. So meaning you don't want to be superficial coming through because if the electrodes is in that area too close to the skin, when you stimulate, it pinches the patient. If it's too close to the muscles, then it's going to be contracting the muscles. So one way or the other becomes uncomfortable. So it's very important. That's why usually when I start, I don't start per like in a a slow way, I usually do like an acute perpendicular. So I, when my needle goes acute perpendicular, I find the layer, so the plane, and then I move like that in a, in a perpendicular plane so I can keep going and slide through. Okay, I don't know if you guys understood, but it is, that's why I'm expert. Um, and this, that was why exactly what I was talking about. You see how we did? So this is a patient of us, and we got off, we hold it, we Left and we do it. This is how the leads looks after we done the, the plant, where it comes out. When I implanted, actually what I did, uh, we start here because I want to make the incision close to the ear, like we're doing plastic surgery. So pretty much nobody sees this. So I actually start from here, put the leads in the areas that I want, open incision here, and did this stitch inside, made a loop, and then I went to the neck to guided. Okay, and this is about stimulation, previous stimulation. So, <coughs> that's uh, the needle's placement. It's pretty much what we went to show, but they didn't show below. You see there, the patient has the pain in the area, so we mark the pain. You go and put the leads in there, pretty much. So I think I did it with all your guys, one of our patients. She's doing very well. Um, that's an, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to have four leads to cover the areas. So all the areas where the patient has pain, three leads there, and so on. Okay. Let's go now for, um, can you improve the, the view there? To make it bigger? No, to make it lighter. It's really not, doesn't There's look no so well. No? Maybe if you turn on the lights, it's just, just so, yeah. Okay. Popcorn and Coke. What say? We need popcorn and Coke. Coke? Coca-Cola. Oh, Coca-Cola. <laughs> okay. So, neuromodulation option for chronic pain treatment. Uh, we guys have seen a lot. We have been operating a lot. But I really want you guys to get those kind of concepts in your mind in terms of indication, what really is a neuromodulation. I'm a, okay. Okay, that's our hospital. <laughs> okay, this is a kind of old slide pretty much. They said 100 million people. Just in the United States now, the last publishing literature that we have, it was 116 million patients are treated for chronic pain. And currently, 200,000 patients are using neuromodulation uh, just by Medtronics alone. So this is a kind of old line. And what is neuromodulation? It's like you're going to use electrical and chemical modulation. So I want to introduce that concept for you. For you in a sense that when you talk about neuromodulation, not talking about stimulation alone. So neuromodulation 
is the way of treating pain by modulating the central nervous system using either electrical, and when we come to the electrical, we're talking about the dorsal column stimulators or peripheral nerve stimulators that we're doing, and the chemical, we're talking about the intraticle pumps. So the terminology for neuromodulation includes use of the pumps and use of the stimulators. The neurostimulation is a different concept, so it's very good to keep that clear in your guys' mind, the, those differences. Um, so the spinal cord stimulation is what? Implanted devices, deliver electrical pulses to the nerve in the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord that can interfere the transmission of the pain signals to the brain and replace them with a more pleasant sensation. Why we have that definition is because in true, we don't really know how that happens. We know that happens and we had been proven that clinically and scientifically, but we can really tell all the steps and the physiopathology and the, physio, um, the physiology of how that works. It, neurostimulation started a long time ago. They said more than 5,000. Now we really go beyond 200,000 patients. First one, it was 1962. They had the carotid sinus implantation. Then they did a stimulator in 67. There was all, everything was out. There was not implanted. In 1980, there was the first implanted one, programmable, that Medtronics carry on. And actually, the, the story of the stimulator is very interesting. I was there in Minneapolis, and when uh, the, I forgot his name now, the guy from Medtronics, oh, forgot his name, but it, well, he, he was, his wife working in a hospital, and there was having a lot of storms in Minneapolis, you know, and every time they had storms, they go out of power. And in one of those situations, one of the kids who need a, um, they develop a pacemaker, and the pacemaker they had at that time, it was plugged into the electricity. So when the electricity and the power was gone, there was no pacemaker. So in one of those situations, one of the kids died. And he had a, like a kind of shop in the house, and one of the doctors came to him. He used to go there to pick up his wife and talk to this doctor, and he said, "You know what? You gotta do something. You gotta find a make a battery that it works." And he went home, and he actually worked and created the battery for the pacemaker. So when he came back to the hospital, he really didn't thought that the doctor is just gonna put in the patient. He said, "Oh, I developed that. I think why you think." And when he came back, the doctor called him and he already put it on the patient. So that was the first pacemaker. It was the beginning of Medtronics. And then it came the spinal cord stimulators from the same technology. Most of the technology we have in the stimulators are first developed with the pacemakers and then they extrapolate it into the, st the stimulators. So mechanisms. There's a lot of mechanisms and a lot of people defend each one of them. The most well known is the closing of the gate theory. Uh, they believe that we do an antidromic activation of the large diameters. Large diameters mean the beta fibers here, uh, afferent fibers, and by doing that, we pretty much overload all the avenues going to the brain, and there is not really much left for the C fibers to get there and be in process. The other option, inhibition through supraspinal mechanisms involving reduction or the aminobutyric acid level in the uh, periacidotic gray matter. Um, and that's, this is one concept very interesting because when you talk about pumps, uh, some people who, would, who really believe that we should give um, PO opioids, and that's why the use of systemic opioids and intratic opioids may have some synergistic effect is because the pumps should not, usually does not work. They don't believe it work in this mechanism where we use systemic will. Uh, modulation of the sand inhibitory pathway to release the spinal dynorphine in the thoracic spinal cord. Activation of the anterior protector nucleus which has the sand inhibitory pathways on the lower segments. Suppression of the wide dynamic range neurons responsive to sensory inputs. Antidromic release of neuropeptides, substance P, calcitonin gene related peptides, others in the periphery. So pretty much all those mechanisms are the ones who could be interfering 
with the input of those stimuli into the brain, inhibiting the brain to process uh, these stimuli. And that way, instead of feeling the pain, they're going to feel in the stimulation that we're given. Uh, here is the gate theory and the and nerve, uh, spinal cord stimulator is going to work here. The big fibers that we're talking about is the A beta fibers and those are the ones really pretty much can carry on the stimulation from pressure, uh, pressure and buzz, you know, those kind of feelings that we have. And they are very large, they are actually larger fibers and they are myelinated fibers, so they really have better response into the nervous, central nervous system. Okay, this is very, very important and I really would like you guys to take some time and think about this, the indications for neuromodulation. And when they talk about neuromodulation, where I talk about, I'm talking about pumps and stems. Um, so for the neurostimulation, it's clear that the best treatment for radiculopathies, for phantom limb pain, stump pain, neuralgias, when the pain is essentially neuropathic by symptom and ideology, there is no question that the first indication is a stimulator. So your patient comes into me and his main pain is a neuropathy, is a nerve pain, is a neuropathic pain. The best treatment in terms of why it will be my first choice, it will be neurostimulator. If the patient doesn't respond to neurostimulator or has any, any contraindication for neurostimulator, then I think about the neuromodulation through chemicals that will be my intratecal pump. On the other hand, if the pain is diffuse cancer pain, or mostly non-susceptible pain, uh, osteoporotic pain, bone pain, uh, here comes the patient who has chronic history of severe rheumatoid arthritis and diffuse joint pains, axial somatic pain, like low back pain, uh, with no neuropathic pain, that it includes, so my first choice would be the pump. This patient would do better probably with a pump than with stimulation. So there's no uh, indication for the stimulation in those class of patients. Of course, I'm talking about when you can isolate the pain ideology like that. Sometimes you have cancer pain and I did a stimulator. How? This patient had cancer pain, had a mass that was compressing L2. So e even though the ideology was cancer pain, the pain was a radiculopathy. So the patient moved into this class. Here it comes the patients that really overlap and sometimes really don't know which one works better. Uh, Fellback syndrome, why? Because Fellback syndrome has usually axial pain for the posterior elements of the, the spine and it can also have radiculopathies. So it depends on which pain is more intense, it can fail in this category. Uh, complex regional pain syndrome, some patients do very well here and some patients do very well here because all the medications such as lidocaine, bupilvicaine, local anesthetics, clonidine, they usually can respond very well and today pre-alt also give them a good chance of response. Arachnoiditis is also showing that it could be either way even though I usually try to do the stimulation first. But central pain can be unresponsive to anything and it can be really a very challenging pain to treat it. And then it comes the neuropathies in here, but that will be not responsive to this or we're not sure about the ideology, so we can include in here and think about both. So the truth is you have to really reassess your patient, reassess your patient ability of using the stimulator or using the intratecal pump, there's many factors that are going to affect your decision. What will be my first indication? What kind of neuromodulation therapy I'm going to offer to my patient? And there is sometimes a decision made on, based on uh, different variables that are going to let you to conclude as a clinician that it will be the best indication for your patient. Okay, overgoes of the spinal cord stimulation therapy, as we know, is you have to position electrodes in an area of specific near a target. Like yesterday, it was in the OR uh, with k -Van, and we spent like almost two hours uh, having difficulty to position the electrode because there was uh, scar tissue and we had a lot, of, a lot of difficulty to pass on the scar tissue. And I knew it because if I didn't have a good position, the electrode, 
it would not achieve what I want. So I just have to continue trying until we get and use different techniques and work hard until we get the very good position the electrodes. A lot of physicians out there sometimes put it anywhere and hope that the programmer is going to be able to make a miracle. And usually the patient get a very poor uh, coverage or they don't get coverage at all. And that's why sometimes they fail with the trial. So it's very important that you keep that in mind. It's your job and my job to position the electrodes in a very important area. And saying that, sometimes uh, oh, I'm there and I put a, a lead and we start to, to trial the patient. And the patient says, oh, yeah, yeah, I feel there. But remember, the patient is waking up from anesthesia. They're still a little sedated. They're feeling like a kind of very vague. You have to take a little more time and use the different areas because sometimes, yes, you can get the foot and a T9, T8, but it's not as specific. The patient probably has to use a lot to get the foot to that area. When you bring the lead down and you put it at T12, L1, they're going to get a much better coverage. So probably you just, okay, he's feeling the foot and leave it your lead in T9. When the patient wakes up and they're really going to look at that, they're going to have a lot of other uncomfortable feelings by having to give much higher uh, stimulation just to get good coverage. So you really have to have the best position you can to get the good results. And you obvious generate electrical field uh, to the nerve creating paresthesia, paresthesia that overlaps painful area. Program stimulation parameters for maximum effectiveness, patient comfort, energy efficiency. This is very important. In the beginning, I forgot about that, and I have a very few quite those situations that I didn't like it. Um, I led to the rep to think about that, and I don't know if you guys know, but we can have the stimulator on a cycling mode. What that means? It means that they're going to stimulate for, for half second, and half second they're going to be off. So for the patient perception, that half section is like nothing. So for them, they're always being stimulated. But for the battery uh, effi efficiency, it's like half of their life. So, and some of the reps are not really smart to do that. And we have batteries that was not lasting enough. So it's our job to think about energy efficiency as well. And that's another thing with the position of the electrodes. If you have a good position of the electrodes, you're going to usually need a little less amplitude or less intensity on your stimulation to achieve the same pain control that are going to increase your energy efficiency. Um, and reduce medication, restore function, and improve quality of life. Of course, uh, for the point of view of research and establishing a really good uh, response and identify efficiency and efficacy in terms of the treatment, those things is absolutely necessary. Uh, for me, as a pain specialist, may, uh, mostly clinician, I really see patients daily in the office, so I'm really more concerned about patient improvement. Yes, yeah, sometimes what they mean by restore function is questionable. What restore function means, what it's really going back to work, not necessarily. Some people are so debilitating that the ability to bring them to a level they're not going to throw themselves through the window is already restoring function and is really improving quality of life. So those are the kind of things that sometimes that are debating and controversy when you're talking about efficacy. Um, to really have a success therapy, you have to have the good indications, as I explained before. If you get a patient who has multiple joint pains and you want to do a dorsal canal stimulator trial, it's not going to work. You have a pain that essentially posterior elements of the spine is a back pain, but the back pain is facet joint, and the doctor misses it, it's not going to work. Or, not only that, the patient has a combination, actual back pain that is neuropathic in nature with the anterior elements, but they also has a posterior elements, they're going to have a very unclear picture. So they're going to say, well, my back is too hurts, and the back is hurting because this patient has a facet joint that it wasn't treated. And usually what I do with patients that I'm going to do is stimulate trials. I examine them. If they do have any suggestion of posterior elements uh, causing pain, I usually treat it, and if it is, Facet joints, I treat the facets, I treat the SI joint first. 
I do radio frequency, I take that variable out of my picture because there's no way I can convince my patient that, oh, I'll do the, the faster joints later. They're not going to feel that they achieve the results they're looking for. So what I do, I treat that factor first, take the variable out of my discussion on my picture, and then I do my trial. Now the patient, I have three or four cases that I've done this that you guys can see there, that they're, they're doing very well. But that was one factor that contributed for my success. Uh, pain distribution, again, the patient has pain all over the body. It will be very hard for you to put leads everywhere. Uh, and patient factors. We need to get very good coverage. I had patients who come to me and even refer by other physician for implantation. And when I'm going to do the interview, like I do my first visit, there was no coverage. I mean, the patient has pain the whole back, going down the legs, and the very little bit, uh, area, very small area was covered. And this physician sent to me for implantation. I mean, we can't do that. You're not going to get success. That patient is going to have that removed very soon. Um, selection of the patient. You have to have a diagnose or at least know what you're going for. And that's why sometimes patient comes to me for a simulator trial and we spend a lot of time just to gather all the information. I want to see exactly what the diagnosis is, get records from the other physician, make sure I establish the diagnosis to see if I can at least uh, see what kind of the pain I'm treating. Sometimes I send the patient to an EMG, Dr. Celso see the patient from me, has a neurology evaluation, even the patient has gone through other doctors before. So I can really go a little deeper in my diagnosis. Very important, I was talking to Adam another day, this is very important not only for you to establish the therapy, but for insurance to pay for the therapy. You have to establish that you fail other lower levels of therapy. So you have to establish in your notes that the patient had physical therapy. That in usually a lot of times when we see patients in our center because we're tertiary center, we got patients. I get a lot of refer patients from other physicians, another pain specialist. So we're sure those patients went through all of that, but it's not implicit. You have to really establish that the patient has done physical therapy, has went through epidural steroid injections, whatever treatment you had a plan for the patient, the lower therapies level. And then now you've gotten to a point that you have to move on into a more advanced uh, therapy. This, of course, is very, very important because the patient doesn't want to get better. The patient will not get better, no matter what you do. So I don't push patients to have any treatment. It just doesn't work. You get into trouble. You see those patients that a lot of times is in a clinic. If they don't want a procedure and you push them to do, they're not going to get better. They're going to complain about it. They're going to feel complications. It's very important the patient is part of your plan. And usually I teach them so they really understand, at least at that level, what they're going for. So, and a lot of times that's what the psychology does. The psychologist is supposed to uh, also give another perspective to the patient about the stimulation so they can really understand that. The patient has to be motivated, has to be educated. And we actually, uh, Karen is doing her research for a dissertation and one of the, one of the very good um, statistically significant findings about lack uh, failure of dorsal canal stimulator implantation with removals is this patient education. So the level of education so the patient does not understand, does not apply all the mechanisms of the therapy and they actually fail to use the therapy appropriately and get success of the therapy either during the trial period or after the trial during the implantation itself. Okay, and that's pretty much what you guys know. Um, that's how we do our trial. This is very good. This is what we have available. Uh, this is the electrodes that you guys have seen many times. Okay, when we come to therapy, when I'm talking to patients, and a lot of times I have patients who come to me that 10 doctors have already spoke to them about stimulations or intratecal pumps, and they hadn't decided to go for the therapy is because, number one, the doctors do not educate them appropriately, and number two, they don't really make clear the advantage. So the patient, oh, that's, a, oh, I can remove it, or I, they don't understand. They don't understand that they have, there is a test, that they, the test is very simple, it's very safe. I pretty much can tell my patient that during my trial periods, I have zero complications. 
And I do have zero complications. I never had one trial with complications. None, zero. And I've done a lot of trials, and you guys are proof of that. So if you do it correctly, that's not really, you know, even with the, op the steroids or the faucet blocks or everything we do, when you use medications, sometimes the patient can have a reaction to the medication, even if you do everything technically correct. correct. But when you do this, it actually, if you're in the good hands and you know what you're doing, it should be a very, very safe procedure. Is reversible, and the long-term cost is low, and that has been the whole uh, discussion with the insurance to get those approved. Um, and for pumps, I can tell you for sure, it's definitely there a lot of saving, uh, especially with fentanyl and other drugs. Like three, four months of the uh, fentanyl patches and everything is already paying for the pump. Okay, the disadvantage, of course, everything we do has good sides and bad sides. Um, some patients get refractory after the treatment. There's equipment failure. Here and there, we have to do revisions. Uh, I have a patient now that are just implanted and keep coming back. We can't understand, but the battery doesn't work. One day goes on, a day goes off. The leads can have high appearance. We don't understand why the high appearance is there. It's very sensitive electronics, and a lot of things can happen uh, with those trials. And short-term cost is very high. I, approximately now, just the battery is around seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars. The leads around thirteen hundred, fourteen hundred each one of them, and so on. Uh, we need follow-up, and a lot of doctors don't like that because they have to be in contact with the patient. They say you marry your patient, but I really don't think so. There's a problem with the uh, conservative management. You have to have follow-up anyway. They follow you anywhere. Those are the techniques that you guys already seen, the insertion, uh, you have to confirm the lead in position, the guide wire, insert the lead, and confirm lead location with fluoroscopy. This is the implant, the pocket formation. Uh, in the beginning, they used to use a lot the front and the flank area. Now, for most of the time, uh, convenience and have the patient ready in a prone position, uh, we move into doing a prone indication area, especially because in the buttocks area, especially because now the batteries became smaller and smaller every day. Okay, those are two studies. One, it was done in 2007, QMAR uh, did the studies comparing spinal cord stimulator and conventional medical management versus conventional medical management in patients alone with fellback syndrome. It was a prospective studies. The bad thing is here, found by Medtronics, um, and but if they have four external advisors, 12 centers, Europe, Canada, Australia, and Israel, and they actually had good exclusion criteria, and the results, they cross over the patients from one treatment to another treatment, and at the end, they found that was in six months, uh, spinal cord stimulator has 48% of improvement in pain control when conservative management only had 9%, that is the P. In 12 months, they found the same good response to the dorsal cord stimulator, and convention medical management was only 18%. That was one of the very important studies that really has been reinforced the, the acceptance of the insurance to pay and make really something viable in terms of therapy for chronic pain patients. Okay, that's the strength of the study. It was a mode center study. It was data collection was frequent. There was a good sample size uh, and conservative analysis was done. But then on the other hand, it was non-blind. Of course, it's very hard to do blind studies with dorsal cord stimulator. There is no way you can do that. It was sponsored by industry. Again, very hard to not do it. In, it's sponsored by industry. It requires a lot of money. Um, and it was not assessed by independent party. So they conclude that, as we know, fellback syndrome is difficult to treat. There is strong evidence that spinal cord stimulator is a good option for neuropathic pain associated with fellback syndrome. And due to the incidence of complications, they're very minimal, um, but they're present, it cannot be the primary treatment. 
Today, this has been changing dramatically. In the letter of treatments, um, they actually, when you go into those meetings, they actually put in much earlier and pretty much right after we use the third letter of medications, like right after patients not responding to uh, physical therapy, patients not responding to Tylenols and Motrins and anti-inflammatories, that it, you're going to be moving the patient, consider moving the patient for the opioid therapy, you already can have an option to go into stimulation. And this is due to very low incidence of serious complication and knowing today that the opioid therapy can cause a lot of problems as well. So if you can fit the patient that level there before you start opioid therapy and get them in high doses of controlled substances, it might be a great choice in terms of treatment. Okay, there was another study that was brought up in 2010 by Kinler. It was published in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and even though it's 2000, but it was one of the greatest one that we had to really establish uh, complex regional pain syndrome as FDA approved and labeled therapy for a dorsal column stimulator. I'm not going to spend much time there because I want to talk about um, here there was they did initially the pain level with conservative management only and dorsal column stimulator after a few months and see when it's dropping this is the conservative management and this is the dorsal column stimulator. 2007 North published again a very good one. Uh, in this time he had a, a controversial controller trial again with uh, fell back syndrome and moving into conservative management. It was a very complex table. You guys can see patients start here. They were randomized in one area and then they could cross over. They could go into another surgery or they could go into the spinal cord stimulator and they actually could cross over, do the surgery and it didn't work, come back to stimulator or vice versa. And go here. Yeah, both together, QMAR and North doing a new one. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, yeah, spinal yeah. Cord versus free mm -hmm. Okay, and they found out that spinal cord stimulator is more cost effective. It was actually to prove and to see if they can get approval from the insurance, then we operation and select fell back syndrome patient. It should be initial therapy and a mean follow up of 3.1 years. <coughs> okay, the new direction, neurostimulation, off label indications, we already had talked about it. Occipital neuralgia, headaches, motor cortex, angina. Um, also, we have for peripheral vascular disease. Um, in, in Europe now, peripheral vascular disease has really gained a big field there, and dorsal column stimulator for treatment as a primary treatment, and showing not only improvement in the pain, but improving in the flow by documentation. There's some kind of scientific, there are a lot of scientific studies proving that. It's T4, T3, T4, and that's when we stimulate that. So, and I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, I'm sorry, I had a question too. The, for peripheral vascular disease, you were saying... Yeah. I said that now in Europe, uh, not only it was proven, that's two or three studies already showing, they did it some, the measurement of the O2 set at the low extremities, and they actually found that not only it improves the pain control, but it also improves the flow. Uh, we put the leads to 9010. So we're doing now, and actually, what I think uh, that is, they are now in development. This new lead that they, we're not going to be going into the dorsal column. Actually, uh, that's why I was closing here to talk to you guys about it. Now, there is two things. I came for Nans, and before Nans, when they when they meet uh, Tom Deere, that's what we're talking about a little bit what is about to come. So now they actually already had designed a lead that we're going to put at the ganglion, right at the root exit. So we're going up into dural space, but instead of to, lead, to leave the lead at the midline, as we usually do, we're going to have a little other dev device that's going to help us to get the lead at the root exit, so what the ganglions are. So we're going to be stimulating the ganglions, the root ganglions. So for the peripheral vascular disease, it'll be even better because really we're doing the sympathetic involvement. For RSD, probably it will be even better. That we, the response is going to be even better. 
So that's the new thing that's about to come. It's a small leader lead, it's a different lead, and that's why right, they, they're doing a lot of studies now. There are already some malt center tires in Europe, uh, in, uh, in the United States as well. And I want to talk to you guys about the adaptive stem that it came out. So pretty much how it works. I don't know if any of you guys has been uh, involved or read about it. It was released by FDA now on November 19. Uh, so we already can use uh, KVN. It was the first fellow involved in a placement in the Northeast in the United States. Uh, so it's a shame you dropped it on the ground like that. Oh, I told him, you have only one battery, please. Let's, let's be, it was a lot of pressure with us. But basically what happens is that the lead is the same, the implantation of the lead is the same. I thought they're going to have some mechanism for the lead to feel the difference in the epidural space, but it's not. What happens is that the pocket is going to learn by a sensor in terms of the direction of the body. So you're going to put the battery there. So it's the battery that has the sensor. So when the patient is lying down, you're going to, have, you're going to go there and you're going to program the patient with the amplitude that they want when they are lying down. As the patient, then we ask the patient to sit up, and we're gonna program the patient when the patient's sitting up. You're gonna have the patient walking or jogging, whatever they do, if they can jog, and we're gonna say, this is how you want when you're doing this. So the battery learns those changes. And in each position, you can have six programming if you want to, different programmers for each position. Um, and this is one way to do. So the, you program as the patient is there and you input into the battery. The other way you do, the battery will be able to also learn. You don't program anything. You give it the programmer to the patient and you tell the patient, every time that you have a difficulty or you feel like too much or too little, you go up and go down. And if you leave it for more than three minutes at the setting, the battery learn that's the new setting that you want. And then every time the battery senses that you are in that position, the battery automatically changes to that program in seconds. I think it's 19 seconds, if I'm not uh, wrong about the precision. So you usually wait until a month or more later because you want to make sure that your pocket is really formed because otherwise the battery is going to be moving in your pocket without positioning so it's going to give you a false change in sensor so you wait for that um, there's one thing in that uh, is a great hit for Medtronics but if you go into talking to Boston Scientific ANS well what they say is that well they fix it down problem why? Because with uh, the, the difference between the custom current is when, when you're using ANS, the patients do not feel that much in intensity. The, the changes in position as much. So that uncomfortable position, the shock that patients sometimes refer to you, well, I was sitting, and then anyway, as soon as I, I was lying down, as soon as I, lie, I was sitting up, as soon as I lying down, or vice versa, I felt this big shock. Usually, and that's true, you don't see that much with the system is for ANS and Boston Scientific. But there's one improvement that I think will be very important. So in other words, they say, well, Medtronic is doing this to fix their own problem. And because those changes in position causing shock, uncomfortable feeling happens much more with um, Medtronic. So the study was done with Medtronics and Medtronics. And the number of patients that felt uncomfortable feeling is also patients who had a Medtronics stimulator. So when they did the data, how many patients felt uncomfortable? And they said 70% of the patients feel changing in positioning causing them uncomfortable feelings. They're talking about Medtronic patients. They didn't really study and put every other poll. On the other hand, that's one thing that I think will be important. We don't see that working much. That will be important for every patient. It's patients who lose the capacity of feeling it. So I think especially for neck, in neck, and no matter how good you position it, because the neck is so mobile, if you're not doing a paddle lead, um, 
probably in the future we're going to be clinically more prone to doing a Medtronic lead. We may change when you see this happening, but because with the neck, as the patient moves, the position, we change. A lot of patients with the neck, they don't like it because as they move, they're doing fine here. As they move, they shock. Or if they don't move, they don't feel it. So they, they lose it. They have to be in one position to feel it. As they move the position, they don't feel it anymore. So I think for neck, we're going to be able probably to do that. I don't know. So they have to have a different sensor. It doesn't work with the sensor that we have now because position is going to be the same. They're sitting up. So it's not really fixing that. For back, some patients also, when they go, they lead, they're so far from the dorsal column, they don't feel it. And the patient has to be actively going up or actively going down when they move in position. So for those patients, I think it will be clinical significant in terms of efficacy adding on to their success rate in terms of pain control. So basically, that's where we have around now. Um, and any questions?